So uh, then welcome to our second panel of our conference on digitalizing international affairs. And uh, the first panel basically did a little bit of a groundwork for today's conference. We uh, looked at the technological parameters and I think it was quite exciting and we transgressed a little into the natural sciences and computer sciences. And that's obviously a very important task for us here. Um, but now we zoom in more onto the question about what actors, what international actors do with these digital technologies and how does it actually change the dynamics between these actors. And uh, we look at uh, a variety of those actors. Uh, so we look at traditional diplomats, uh, we look at social movements, and so on. So uh, basically, uh, all of those actors that in modern days populate the diplomatic stage, no matter they're no matter whether they're called traditional or non-traditional. Um, I have uh, beforehand quickly introduced uh, all the presenters already. I'll just uh, very quickly do that again. We're going to have uh, four talks. There is one on tech diplomacy by Clara Blume and Martin Rauchbau from Open Austria. Uh, welcome vertically in, in Vienna. Uh, they, are, uh, they join us uh, from California, so quite far away. Um, then uh, we have Veronika Wittmann, who uh, joins us from uh, just upstream the Danube, uh, from the Kepler University of Linz. She's going to give a talk on digital diplomacy versus downfall an agenda for international relations in the global age. Then uh, we have Stephanie Wuschitz from Ms. Balthasar Lab. Um, on, she's going to talk on feminist strategies in digitalization in Indonesia. Hello, Hello Stephanie. And, uh, and then uh, at the end, we're going to have yet another Stephanie, Stephanie Ness, who is uh, one of our doctoral students. And she's going to talk on improving social justice through digitalization, lessons learned from Central America for Austria. And uh, so we're going to go in the order in which I just uh, read the program. And, uh, and I would like to request all the presenters to stick to the 10 minutes, perhaps 12 minutes, but not more than that, so that we have enough time for discussion. And we're going to do all the talks in a row, one, two, three, four, and then we're going to open up for discussion. That means I'm going to give the word now to Clara Blume and Martin Rauchbauer. Excellent. Good morning. Good morning, everybody here from sunny California. Uh, very early morning here. We have a nine hour time difference here um, from Open Austria, which is a government uh, initiative that we would like to present to you as an example, as an early example of what we call tech diplomacy, a new way for nation states to engage with the global tech industry. And in the first panel, we heard uh, a lot about science diplomacy, scientists engaging uh, in diplomacy. This is about traditional diplomacy, uh, about diplomats uh, engaging with technology in a new way. I'm a career diplomat of the Austrian foreign ministry. I do not have any a tech background uh, and was sent in 2016 uh, to open up uh, Open Austria. And I'm now the Austrian tech ambassador and one of the two directors of Open Austria. Yes, um, hello, and my name is Clara Bloom. Um, I had a new institution that was just founded, the Open Austria Art and Tech Lab, and I also run our European, our EU cluster for art and technology in Silicon Valley. So, what is Open Austria? Uh, and uh, it's a, a kind of a new uh, umbrella term for the Austrian official representation in Silicon Valley. That's really our mission. We connect Austria and Silicon Valley. That's uh, our mission from uh, the beginning. Uh, we have uh, as a mission uh, to uh, be a focal point for Austrian entrepreneurs, for startups, for scientists, for researchers, for policymakers, uh, for creative minds, that is also for artists. We are also a platform for successful Austrians in the tech industry, in academia, in Silicon Valley. And we want to bring innovative ideas, people and projects back home to Austria from Silicon Valley. 
where we located, uh, we are in a co-working space that's also unusual for traditional diplomacy uh, in uh, San Francisco, where most of the co-working spaces are in a region called Soma, south of Market Street. Uh, and this is where we operate uh, in the middle, embedded into the local innovation ecosystem. And we were launched in October 2016 as a unique joint venture of the Austrian Foreign uh, Ministry uh, together with the VECA or the Austrian Business and Trade Commission, uh, and also as an arm of foreign uh, direct investment into Austria, we have by now uh, adopted the Austrian Business Agency as a partner into Open Austria. And so our mission is to connect the innovators, entrepreneurs, scientists, and scholars, as well as artists and creatives with the innovation ecosystem in the San Francisco Bay Area. Yes. I'll take over from here. So Silicon Valley, perhaps a couple of words on the region where we operate in. It's clearly the world's largest and most important innovation ecosystem. Um, it formerly it, um, was born more in the South Bay. That's the original Silicon Valley, as you can see, where still the majority of companies are located at. Um, it now stretches into the broader Silicon Valley ecosystem that includes the city of San Francisco, where now lots of tech companies have um, have uh, launched their headquarters, and it includes two major universities, um, which are Stanford and UC Berkeley. Also, there's five reasons that contributed to this unique success story um, that are very, very hard to replicate, even though they're trying to be replicated all over the world, which would be the spirit of cooperation, cultural diversity, top-notch universities, venture capital, and clearly big tech. And as you can see to the right, it's here, the birthplace of Eli Packard, the original garage with its original founders, a bit of an emblematic picture here. Um, so we focus on frontier technologies. This is our bread and butter. Um, what our frontier technologies, very quick, it includes everything from machine learning, AI, robotics, wearable tech, mixed reality, 5G, autonomous vehicles, blockchain, drone technology, biotech, and a lot more. Just a couple of words on um, the new um, parameters that we operate in, in tech diplomacy and cultural diplomacy. Um, the, in 2014, there was a new buzzword that entered our vocabulary and hasn't left since. It's the portmanteau word of the tech lash, which is a backlash against technology. It was triggered by um, the voter uh, profiling company, Cambridge Analytica, that scandal, it was a data mining scandal, triggered an avalanche of consequences since they accessed um, 50 million Facebook um, users' data. And four years later, um, we see that picture, also pretty emblematic. Zuckerberg, Facebook CEO, appeared in front of the US Senate's Commerce and Judiciary Committee to discuss data privacy and Russian disinformation on the social network. He apologized. and. Um, committed to stricter data protection rules and practices for Facebook. And I'd like to quote um, this passage from the Senate hearing, which has become almost a meme at this point. So Zuckerberg is questioned by Senator Hatch, and Senator Hatch asks questions now. Mr. Zuckerberg, I remember well your first visit to Capitol Hill back in 2010. You spoke to the Senate Republican High, Task, High Tech Task Force, which I chair. You said back then that Facebook would always be free. Is this still your objective? Zuckerberg responded, Senator, yes, there will always be a version of Facebook that is free. It is our mission to try to help connect everyone around the world and to bring the world closer together. In order to do that, we believe that we need to offer service that everyone can afford. We're committed to doing that. Hatchberg answering, Hatch answering, well, if so, how do you sustain a business model in which users don't pay for your service? And the emblematic answer, Senator, we run ads. And that basically um, was the beginning of sort of a watershed moment um, where not only um, consumers, but also policymakers realized that there's no such thing as a free product. And if, there, if it is, um, then clearly the consumer is product. And so um, that was the moment where we started to advocate um, as a European Commission for, um, as a European unit for much more data literacy among consumers, but also policymakers. 
So um, this was a, a, a watershed year, as Clara mentioned, 2018, uh, for European countries uh, to engage with the tech industry and talk about regulating tech. Uh, the uh, moment that the senator in Congress didn't understand uh, that uh, how the, the, the basic business model, not just the Facebook, but a lot of these internet platforms, also pointed to a lack of competence, of, of, of comprehension on, behind, on the side of policymakers. And the idea uh, of, uh, um, you know, tech diplomacy was also to uh, narrow this gap and to uh, bring and engage um, European policymaking into Silicon Valley. It was also the year where the General Data Protection Act, the watershed landmark legislation from Europe, um, uh, entered into force, uh, and I would like to talk a little bit about that, uh, a major privacy legislation, as we uh, all know, which had also global ripple effects and uh, became a landmark legislation uh, outside of Europe as well. A lot of other data protection uh, regimes uh, in Asia, for example, adopted or, or adapted to GDPR, and that also happened in Silicon Valley in California, where um, the California Consumer Privacy Act uh, was uh, entered into force in 2019 through a popular initiative, actually not through uh, polit polit politicians uh, um, advocating for it, but it was it came out of uh, activists, privacy activists. And uh, there was an update and an upgrade of this California Consumer Privacy Act uh, just a few weeks ago uh, on a election day, Proposition 24 was adopted, making the CCPA, the California legislation, even closer to uh, GDPR. And that was uh, something, uh, a very concrete example of where tech diplomacy, where tech diplomats uh, engaged, having these talks between Europe and California, between Europe and uh, Silicon Valley about uh, privacy legislation. So what makes diplomacy relevant and special in Silicon Valley? It's obviously that a lot of the technological advancement, advancement, advancements that affect the economy, um, uh, our policy and our society have their origins there. But it also has to do with the fact that many of these tech companies, particularly the big internet platforms, increasingly act like nation states. Just to give you a, a figure, uh, Apple, uh, the, the, in, in terms of market uh, capitalization and, and revenues, um, uh, biggest uh, co company uh, in, in, uh, in Silicon Valley would be number 15 when it comes uh, to uh, its revenue. It would be the 15th largest e economy on a global stage. Uh, of course, uh, Silicon Valley is also important uh, as an actor, as a partner, as a stakeholder when it comes to issues of cybersecurity, as we heard in the first panel, or the protection of human rights and internet freedoms. Uh, and is also relevant uh, for nation states to be present here, uh, kind of as antennas into the future, ensuring the stability of the future development of individual nation states by staying on the forefront of tech advan advancements and anticipating its policy implications. So uh, what it makes diplomacy relevant and special in Silicon uh, Valley, uh, it's a dialogue between the tech industry and governments and not uh, in the policy hubs uh, in our capitals like DC, uh, Brussels or Vienna, but right there where the technologies uh, origins. And of course, uh, Silicon Valley, as I mentioned before, is also an important regulator of technology uh, via the state of California. So what are the concrete initiatives we are engaging with in tech diplomacy? Uh, one is Europe as a regulator of tech. Uh, the European Union, uh, and Austria is a member of it, uh, is about to regulate artificial intelligence. There's been a white paper coming out in February 2020. We're engaging in talks with the private sector and with the industry. Uh, there's an upcoming Digital Service Act. Uh, that will, among other things, regulate content moderation of coming up from the European Union. We're engaged uh, in talks with the private sector. When it comes to human rights in the digital age, uh, Austria is a member of the Freedom Online Coalition. We engage with talks with the private sector. When it comes with the UN, uh, a digital agenda, the roadmap on digital cooperation initiated by the Secretary General, we are engaging on behalf of the UN and together with the UN with the private sector. Uh, this is a new initiative. When it comes to a, a broader uh, issue of 
you know, looking at the values that underpin uh, uh, Silicon Valley, and which are often problematic. We are trying to work on that as well. And Clara is going to talk about that. This new digital humanism is a very Austrian initiative, bringing a human centered approach uh, to technology. And of course, we also promote Austria as a European hub for technology and attract uh, tech players, small and big. Salesforce, as an example, just opened uh, uh, European representation in Vienna. We attract uh, tech companies uh, to Austria as a European hub for technology. So uh, last but not least, we also engage uh, when it comes uh, to internet freedoms um, in a global kind of sense, the Freedom Online Coalition um, at its annual meeting in February in Accra, where I gave a keynote speech about how to engage uh, with the private sector when it comes to internet freedoms, uh, which are under threat uh, worldwide, as been mentioned in the previous uh, panel, just we, we think of the potential of frontier technologies to suppress human rights by authoritarian countries. Okay, thank you, Martin. Um, this is where I take over to really very brief introduce you to our cultural diplomacy efforts in Silicon Valley. So to complement this more um, top-down approach where you immediately start to enter on an executive level in a dialogue, we complement the tech diplomacy approach with a more bottom-up approach by first learning the cultural context in which we operate, and uh, we engage with a variety of art institution organizations and artists as individuals. And um, as a second step, we proactively engage with the tech industry since um, that is a dialogue we want to encourage, especially also with individuals there, with technologists, developers, and engineers that are open to a dialogue. The third step would build uh, would be to build sustainable networks of a broad variety of contacts from both Europe and the US, especially the Bay Area, to help strengthen partnerships, peer-to-peer um, -peer partnerships, actually, between artists and technologists. And the fourth step might be the more um, experimental, which is to start pilot projects where we place artists within tech R&D teams to shape technology at its core, where we clearly uniquely positioned here in Silicon Valley. And perhaps to name one successful pilot project would be the successful Austrian-German author Daniel Kehlmann was successfully placed um, within an AI lab in Palo Alto, where he worked with a technologist on a natural language processing tool that was meant to help creatives um, trigger the creative process. Those are very, very advanced tools, and Daniel Kehlmann could actually help shape technology in a way that was much more conducive to the creative process. You can see here on the right, Austrian street artist Nichols making his first ever virtual reality graffiti. Um, so as Martin mentioned, um, there's a new portfolio that is where, where the art and tech efforts and our tech diplomacy efforts overlap. It's an Austrian initiative, one could say, of the digital humanism. So um, this is really a sphere where cultural diplomacy can be a powerful instrument to advocate for universal um, human rights and to preserve what we call a human dignity that is a threat um, in the current environment. Um, and so if you see artists as cultural ambassadors that can really promote a more inclusive, just and human-centered technology that um, is at the service of all humankind, then clearly artists um, can step up to the role and um, be much more proactive. And so when it comes to the human machine interaction, we've seen that it is important, it's imperative that right now we focus on um, a more diverse and more inclusive creation, implementation and adaptation of cultural tools. Um, and so we've already done that um, with the first initiative, um, a cultural initiative from our European Cluster of Art and Tech here in Silicon Valley, which Open Austria has been chairing for a year and a half. It is co-funded by both the European Commission and the private sector. It's called The Grid, and our motto is Art Powers Technology. So it's our deepest conviction that it's the artistic process that triggers innovation for every digital tool that we've ever used. And therefore, it's inherently impossible to separate those two realms. Um, and our initiative, The Grid, focuses on connecting art, tech, and the third silo, Policymakers. So this is really a triangle. 
Um, we've done so at a lounge in 2019. As you can see, no one's wearing masks. So this is a different age still. Um, together with Google, Mozilla, OpenAI, all the big players were present and everyone was actually advocating for this digital humanism. Um, we've launched a festival in the midst of a pandemic. It's called Exposure Art Tech and Policy Days last September with 16 partner organizations. Um, one of the most prestigious ones um, has recently launched a movie on Netflix called The Social Dilemma, which I recommend to everyone because it pretty much explains the ecosystem in which we operate in. We did this, and as Austrian pretty proud of it, in cooperation with the Ars Electronica Festival as the official AI and music garden Silicon Valley. So that was a festival of four days with 26 events and over 100 speakers from 12 countries, where we had everything entirely virtual, art panels, interactive, interactive experiences, live performances, immersive tech, and workshops on the topics of AI and creativity, for example, universal basic income for the arts and a very ambitious um, tech diplomacy portfolio called Taming Tech, which Martin needs. You can see the entire festival on our website, getonthegrid.org slash exposure. Um, please get on the grid, <laughs> contact us and check out the initiative. And with that, I say thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for your presentation. I think there was a noise, but it's, it's gone. Thanks a lot for your presentation. And I'm going to hand over straight away to uh, our next presenter, and that's Veronika Wittmann. Well, thank you very much. Um, a warm welcome from the city, actually, where our Electronica Festival is uh, situated, from Linz. I would like uh, to talk on digital diplomacy versus downfall, an agenda for international relations in the global age. Uh, my background is coming from a social scientist perspective, and I'm teaching global studies at Kepler University of Linz. Let me just start by uh, mentioning um, global challenges, um, endangering humanity, influencing world politics and international relations. Uh, besides, like all these technical, technological risks, we see transnational terrorism, we been hearing about climate change, loss of biodiversity. We are all experiencing COVID-19 as a global pandemic now. And of course, there are a lot of like technological risks being involved, like the information infrastructure breakdown or the lack of contemporary technology governance. And it's quite clear that diplomacy has to take these needs into account and contribute with profound expertise to academic as well as political discussions. A basic assumption here is that any nation state related or disciplinary solar effort will not provide adequate answers how humanity can manage and cope with these global risks in the 21st century. Uh, digital diplomacy in this perspective um, is seen as a very powerful and a very effective tool actually to prevent humanity's downfall. Generally, digitalization represents, represents nothing less than a civilizational revolution. And of course, diplomacy is part and parcel of this global development. And digital diplomacy refers to the use of digital information communication technologies, ranging from video conferencing um, to social media platforms by diplomats as global actors in world politics and in international relations. So the role of diplomats as global actors in this context is very decisive for the future of humanity. Uh, diplomats can be seen specifically as skilled experts who have expertise in trying to solve conflict situations, not in a military way, but in a peaceful manner. And more than other professionals, they are trained to figure out constructive ways of solving difficult and complex political scenarios. And digital diplomacy can hereby function as a contemporary tool for reaching understanding in a world faced with common crisis. Uh, so let me just mention five uh, criteria that diplomacy overall has in this global age has to meet. First of all, diplomacy has to orientate itself on a given socioeconomic and political reality. This reality in the 21st century is generated by this global and digital dynamics. 
The second criteria diplomacy has to meet, it has to consider global consciousness as a worldwide experience of people. Globality is a given reality of human beings and should be taken into account for future international relations. Just to mention the point of uh, planet Earth, for instance, very prominent in environmental discussions. So globality is a given reality of, of all human beings, so to say. The third criteria diplomacy has to deal with is the social and political structures, processes and relations which are actually world spanning. Uh, so we've seen actually from the 1990s onwards a political power shift in world politics and states are by no means the only players in this field of world politics anymore, but we see a rising number of transnational civil society organizations becoming more and more relevant in world politics. Uh, maybe just to mention Greta Thunberg and the Friday, Fridays for Future movement of a young generation uh, taking place in several states in this world now. The fourth criteria diplomacy has to meet is of course the requirements of this digital age. Um, technological um, innovations have an enormous influence on humanity in this century digital information communication technologies, as well as artificial intelligence, as being mentioned in our first panel, change social and political structures, processes and relations in a profound and in a sustainable way. And of course, the working spheres of diplomats will alter due to these technological innovations. And the five, fifth criteria, the fifth point that um, is mentioned here is that diplomacy has to actively participate in digital processes and in a visionary claim of a global turn in politics. So digital participation is an essential of contemporary uh, diplomacy and part and parcel of this global turn in politics. In this sense, thinking of these five criteria, diplomacy in current times has to perform wide ranging tasks. Let me just um, come to this visionary claim of a global turn in politics and uh, diplomacy's contribution toward this undertaking by considering political development trends in the 21st century. Uh, these visionary claims are based on three main assumptions. First of all, as I mentioned in the beginning, the challenges for humanity in this area are enormous. So global crises uh, shape humanity and human life all over the world. And these global challenges require innovative cross-disciplinary and transnational spaces, and they also address the need for global cooperation. So no academic discipline or no state alone can just cope with these challenges. For instance, if you think of Darknet, um, this underlying network, uh, it already changed political power in a traditional sense of the world. So no nation state in the world, however strong it might be military, uh, in military terms, no nation state can cope with it on its own. And the same, it requires cross-disciplinary approaches. So rapid technological changes will cause the substantial transformation of human life in this century. And at the same time, technological chances, as well as these risks of digitalization taking place on a global scale, will also shape the future of diplomacy itself. That relates to the question uh, you know, of addressing um, diplomatic curricula, the diplomatic core around the world to get a professional and competent training in how to deal with digital tools. Uh, and then the third assumption here is diplomacy uh, is a key player in developing a global plan for humanity. Global risks themselves that affect all people as well as resulting socioeconomic and political crisis are universal problems. Uh, information and knowledge in dealing with this global crisis must be shared globally by diplomats as global actors and diplomacy must provide expertise on perceiving the dilemma of global discordance in world society and in world politics 
confronted with this global crisis. So digital information communication technologies and artificial intelligence are essential tools for the future of world society and for the shaping of world politics. And therefore diplomacy has to embrace these tools as a medium of communication with open arms in order to, to participate quite well. Uh, let me come to my last point. Um, I think um, like as a future scenario, digital diplomacy can make significant contributions in the global age by taking into account an understanding of diplomacy that is open to face the challenges of humanity confronted with global risk, transnational similarities and rapid technological changes. And what is needed in this century to give adequate answers to the challenging questions of humanity is shared knowledge in dealing with global risks as such a global turn um, in politics. And of course, this will not be an easy task at all, but I think it's diplomacy's most promising way of offering humanity its expertise in this area. And it will be a universal agenda at the end of the day. And diplomats as global actors can make a substantial contribution to a joint understanding of our common digital future. And they also can be architects uh, of a global commitment for digital cooperation, as much as they are trained, professional trained experts to find uh, solutions for difficult scenarios and to figure out ways of cooperation at a global scale. Thank you very much for your attention. Maybe in the future we will see diplomats like this colleague here. Veronica, thank you very much. And uh, we like the last the last image. I think I'll keep that in, in mind with the, with the dove. And uh, I still hope though that diplomats are going to look a little less technical in, in the future, but we're going to go into that in the, in the discussion. Um, the next one on my list is uh, Stephanie Wuschitz, and she's going to talk on feminist strategies and digitalization in Indonesia. Stephanie, you have the word. Hello, I'm so honored to be with you and get into a conversation with all of you. My name is Stephanie Wuschitz. I'm an artist working with interactive technology and democratization of digitalization. And I want to share my slideshow now with you, which is taking you somewhere completely different than we are now, which is Java Island. Um, I was um, doing a residency there as an artist for three months, and I was really surprised how many fab labs, maker spaces, art collectives, performance artists, and hacker spaces there exist, uh, especially around Jogjakarta, which is an autonomous area in Indonesia. And I was getting curious how that could come about. And I started to um, dig deeper into the history of Indonesia. So in Indonesia, there was very early feminist activism already. A lot of different organizations from different religious groups and ethical groups always came together for one big Congress, Women's Congress already in 28. And uh, they were also very important in getting independence. So it was a lot of women involved into the independence war of 300 years col colonizing, being ended through the foundation of the Indonesian nation state. Uh, Indonesia has a very rich and a very diverse culture. Every island of these more than 2,000 islands has its own language and culture and tradition. And uh, especially on Java, there's this tradition which is kind of written into the DNA of Javanese uh, urban culture that people organize on a grassroots level in local groups. It's kind of an old system of microcredit groups, an old system of mutual self-help from um, teaching each other skills, um, sharing things, redistributing goods. It's a kind of grassroots governance. And this very close knit urban um, village uh, slash <laughs> structures, they uh, enabled 
people to be very resilient, although there was first colonizing for 300 years and then there was um, a lot of trouble in the continuous uh, history of Indonesia. I'm not a historian, I'm an artist, so please excuse me if it's not completely accurate the way I try to sum it up, but um, the first president of Indonesia was Sukarno, who tried to um, bring together these very different groups in Indonesia. There was a lot of really religious people, a lot of really nationalist people who were very enthusiastic about this new independent state. And there were a lot of communists uh, in the country. And he tried to make this NASA.com, how he called it, like this merging of the three um, powers, which uh, in the end he failed because the military took over. But I don't want to get ahead of myself. Sukarno was very much like a social democrat, I would say, very much like Kreisky in Austria. <laughs> and he supported these female organized groups that were really kind of taking a lot of responsibility off the government's shoulders by organizing really well on a grassroots level all things that you would need from a public service, from uh, waiting babies regularly to check the health uh, until like organizing funerals if the family was overwhelmed, like it was the whole life spent organized through these women uh, centered groups. And the most important group that was becoming uh, most relevant is Gervis, which was founded in 1950 and later was called Gervani. And that's what I'm researching on for my postdoc at the TU in Berlin. Um, Gervani uh, was the Self, a group of self-confident women of Indonesia. That's what the uh, shortcut means. And the woman who is standing there is not just anyone. Um, she is the very first minister, minister, social minister in Indonesia, she, Maria Ulfa Santoso. Uh, she was already social minister in 1946, 10 years before there was a female minister in Austria. And she was also the first person who was a woman and made a degree in law. And she was a typical, actually, Gavani founding members because a lot of women who got into universities at that point organized themselves. And they also joined forces with farmers and they joined forces with workers. Uh, and they tried to find shared goals. For example, they were against polygamy. All of them, they got them all really mad that they would not have any say about their uh, belongings because of polygamic law, marriage laws. And um, what they did is they went to small farms, to small rural areas and made literacy workshops. Um, and in these literacy workshops, they found out a lot about the struggles of people on the countryside. And because they implemented that into their agenda as an NGO, they increased tremendously. They had, after 10 years, 1 million members this feminist organization. It was not a political party ever, but as a feminist organization it was the biggest women's organization at that point in the world. It was the biggest women's movement in the world in Indonesia. Um, so uh, Gavani was uh, very much born out of this um, enthusiasm of studying your own nation state and being independent from colonialism. So they were very clearly against all kind of new imperialism and foreign capital. They really wanted uh, people to own the Indonesian mines and own the Indonesian gold and Indonesian copper and Indonesian um, export. Uh, so the Indonesians wanted to own their own factories. And they also condemned the coup d'etat that already happened on Sukarno earlier. Um, what, what really put them all together, all these different groups of women in Indonesia was this fight against polygamy and abuse against women. And they also set up a the first kindergartens and the first social structures of schools uh, to prevent violence against women. It was very much orientated towards Denmark and, uh, and um, um, pedagogy in Denmark back then. Uh, they had uh, also media, but not as strong. The, most of their work was done through this peer-to-peer -peer and peer production, but they had this Apicatini magazine that had a lot of DIY and uh, education um, sections. Um, the thing is that uh, at that point, Sukarno, the president, was seen as being on the side of the U of Russia in the Cold War. And um, Joseph McCarthy, who was at that point Senate in the government in the US, 
um, was really concerned about uh, Indonesia maybe becoming communist. The Communist Party was not the strongest party in Indonesia and also Sukarno was not communist. He had his own party that was mm, more like social democratic, as I said, like Kreisky. But um, McCarthy was um, intervening into the Indonesian politics in hope to um, prevent Indonesia from continuing its path on the kind of wrong side of the Cold War. Um, and also Lyndon Johnson, who was the president at that time, and who was famous for escalating the war in Vietnam, first uh, had decided to uh, send weapons to separatist groups uh, in Indonesia that would um, subvert the Indonesian government and uh, also trained generals in the US. Um, when it came to Richard Nixon, um, he really uh, joined forces uh, with, with people who tried to get rid of Sukarno. Uh, also the Australian diplomat uh, was kind of warning that Indonesia should not be economically so successful as it is at the moment, because otherwise it will be hard to continue making business with Indonesia. And this women's organization became kind of a perfect enemy uh, because this woman organization was uh, really large. <laughs> they really wanted autonomy and um, the communists didn't like them because they were against polygamy. Uh, and and um, they just had a lot of enemies inside the countries too, but ma mainly also the big players outside of the country who, who really wanted to have their hands on the mines. Mm, so when Richard Nixon um, joined forces with Milton Friedman, um, there is now evidence that they uh, kind of decided, but please don't name me down, I'm not a diplomat, I'm an artist, uh, to bring Suharto into office. Suharto kind of pretended that there would be a coup d'etat and Galvani, that feminist movement, was, insult, was accused to have um, brought a, a couple of Gavani members into the general's home and killed them and cut off their penises, which is completely nonsense. It's now evidence that there was never something like cutting off penises, it never happened, um, or dancing around naked, which were they were also accused of. It was actually an internal militant coup d'etat, but there was very strong propaganda. So Hato had put in place radios everywhere over the country and had cut down on all the media channels and was until 98 in every school in every village of Indonesia perpetuating um, that propaganda of Gavani killing the generals and kind of getting rid of Sukarno um, through movies uh, and, and through radio. Um, what in fact happened in 1965 was that these internal militant uh, groups that were fighting each other um, ended up in Suharto getting into power and this um, pro-Western militant part got into power and uh, started to kill all people who were kind of related either with Sukarno's party, Communist Party or Gavani organizations, cultural organizations, leftist organizations. It was basically a genocide. Um, and there is a lot of evidence now about this military reaction being centralized or orchestrated um, by Annie Pullman and Chess Melvin. Uh, they wrote about it. So most of these women of this organization get killed or put to prison, uh, but they were still having codes of communicating, for example, through certain cooking recipes that contain certain words of things that would put together to cook, but meant actually something else, but also culture groups and um, like bands, singing bands where they met. I mean, today, most of Indonesians exports are still uh, organized by international <laughs> Western companies. Um, but I could find some people who were surviving this kind of genocide and I took interviews with them and they told me about their life in prison. Um, and when the new order regime ended in 1998, a lot of people who were really afraid before to be put into prison because of the new order regime started to make art, started to do feminist activism and technology as a way to express themselves and to exchange themselves. So I'm running out of time, but um, I, they don't know usually what happened because it's a taboo and it's a, 
uh, Gavani is really stigmatized. No one, even in the family, don't talk about this. You know, people don't know that their mom or grandmother was Gavani. But the people who are activists now are really kind of also using this peer um, peer-to-peer -peer workshops and the skill sharing and this kind of physical contact to do prototypes in order to teach a different skill. Uh, but what's really different from uh, the activists back then is that they usually have only English websites and huge, very professional online performance, social media accounts that are really professional and beautiful. For example, this organization is collecting garbage on a mountain to protect the water and the, the garbage they make into design objects like this um, backpack, for example, it's from car wheels. Um, yeah, so they address environment, environment, environmental issues, but also political issues through art and culture and through this kind of skill sharing events um, or organize big um, conferences, like for example, this Women's Thought School to exchange knowledge. Uh, but usually it's all, um, directed towards an international community and no one in Indonesia hears about it. I mean, it's really rare that something is really directed to an Indonesian audience. People are really not trusting Indonesian uh, national uh, media. Um, okay, I'm sorry, I'm totally over the time, already two minutes over the time. I just wanted to mention this activist. She, is, um, uh, she started these workshops uh, for women, how to weave in the traditional way with uh, natural materials. And she had 150 women for one year sitting on this land that the mines wanted to take, but um, they kind of occupied the land weaving. Um, their husbands took over all the reproductive labor at home to care of the kids, to care of all the things that women usually do there, like preparing medicine from forest uh, plants. And after one year of occupying this land weaving, they actually had that mine uh, give the land back to her. Uh, to to these uh, communities, okay. So, um, yeah, mm, I think the time is over. Uh, but I think that the future is really in urban mining, collecting garbage and trying to source um, gold and copper from this electric waste that's uh, now shipped to Southeast Asia, uh, and not continue to mine the way uh, Europe and the US did mine in, in Indonesia until now. Okay, this is just enough. Thank you so much. Um, sorry to have been talking too long. Stephanie, thank you very much. No reason to be sorry. That was a, a, a real, very, very good analysis of a long durée of, of a movement. And we can we'll definitely go back to that and uh, in, in in, in questions and answers as well because it raises the very interesting question whether the new medium, digital, whether that really changes then how, how network and, and how, how mobilization and resonance and everything, how all of that shapes up. Then we're going to move from uh, the one Stephanie to the next Stephanie, that's Stephanie Ness. And she's going to present on improving social justice through digitalization, lessons learned from Central America for Austria. Stephanie, you have the word. Thank you. So in Corona times, many of us are locked down in front of their computers, have their kids sitting in the living room. And what I would like to do today is to example, to share an example of success factors for global policy in education. And um, my core point is that such policy must embrace the socio-economic and political reality of, of people. Um, when we're looking at the kids that we have in school, especially the young ones, which have the ages four to 10, it's in this times really difficult for them. They don't have the contact with the people, they're locked down with their parents. Um, parents are not um, educated to um, care for their kids. Um, in a professional context, like to make them learn, usually everything's arranged in different ways. Now, um, when we're looking at the stance that European states have taken between, I would say, two years ago, 2017, 2016, about um, 
procuring digital technology for schools, then uh, this has been uh, there's been quite a lot of different opinions. Now, when you're checking newspapers, you're seeing a lot of people arguing for purchasing more computers, purchasing new materials, purchasing a lot of um, different items to make this learning easier and to make them um, things better also for working mothers. Um, this goes so far as that there, are, that there are suggestions that you can find in many articles in newspapers of uh, procuring technology for eye tracking so you can actually see and get feedback on uh, whether people is listening to make it easier for educators, um, which technically, yes, it's possible. The question is how much does it help to measure the Euclidean distance between the eyes uh, of kids to see whether they're listening? Does this like attention that we've so much focused on in the last 30, 40 years really leads to learning. And um, in order to uh, partially give you a, a solution from Central America or points that such policy has to address, I would like to share an example um, of how um, a school project became more successful um, and what are the lessons learned in terms of human computer interaction and in terms of digital instructional technology. And I'm gonna show real pictures now. This is actually more than uh, 10 years ago taken in Guatemala. This is um, Distrito 10 uh, in uh, Guatemala. It's a quite poor uh, area where like a lot of families are living with their children. They have many like the space is very limited. Um, there's a lot of uh, socioeconomic problems because all these kids, they live with their families in very close spaces. A lot of people are unemployed. There's a lot of stress usually for the kids when they're at home. And there was a small school project and it didn't scale. And I became part of that school project. And um, at that time, um, organizations that um, that are like basically supporting uh, supporting yeah development um, had tried to um, in uh, invest into school technology like giving them computers putting them into a school but it was very small scale and they were not su successful it didn't work because the kids after two or three days from this project, they would stop going. Mostly um, investigating this further, it was uh, because uh, when you place people in something like that, um, it's, it's helpful, but uh, it's a start, but it's not like, um, solving everything to give them computers and to stream something. And um, the point that it was not solving was the point of their parents and because of their socioeconomic factors, because the mothers would ask them to go to work or they would make them stress at home or they wouldn't be catered. So also there were financial issues. You cannot, this is, hundreds of kids, you cannot uh, finance the school education uh, with no money for hundreds of kids. And um, the solution that we partially adopted was to, put a, was to put a chocolate factory in place in Guatemala to, uh, for two reasons. The first reason being that um, the being that they needed finance. But the second reason was to actually make an important part of the stakeholders, which is their parents, part of the success, pro success of their kids and to give them accountability in the whole procedure. 
And uh, with this policy or measurement taken on a small scale, um, it was the foundation stone of actually putting and scaling the program. Um, because and addressing those points that uh, you cannot fully solve with um, technology, which is basically the human element. So um, this point was, it's a real picture. This is basically um, some kids, this is taken much later. Um, you can see here, giving kids like first class, uh, giving them good clothes, giving them good uh, computers. It's a part, but they also have to get the sense of community, the sense of belonging to make the successful learning. And um, this, uh, this, this is the same school. It's actually the same place, just taken from a different one where we had a little bit more than 10 years ago, it was two, three years later, a construction of the very same school. You see here better facilities, still third world facilities, but uh, in terms of in terms of like the content being taught to those children, it's on par, or it was already at that stage on par with what you learn in Germany in a primary school after. I would say four or five years. And um, when you look at it, this is another three years later, it looks completely different. It's the same place. It's the same trees, it's the same place. Um, and um, I think that this example teaches us that uh, when you take into and factor into the socioeconomic factors, um, you can improve a lot within short time. And it's not only about distributing technology because the learning is evenly distributed. And from that, um, together with uh, psychologists, which were local and with other ones, we developed a model for the learning to scale up the education for the small children. So basically, when you look at small children, you always have um, an input when you're dealing with technology and it's very simplified. There's a lot of literature on, on it, but I would like to focus on the essence. You have a lot of this uh, commentation, but basically when you're having a small kid, you first need to eliminate the other factors which may distract from actually being open to learning. And uh, once you have that, you uh, have different channels for small kids. Those included audio, pictures, text, and videos. Um, those are mostly being taken by this program, but also by similar programs that, are, that have been streaming where internet access is not available. In the program that I was part of, internet access was freely available. You take in this audio via sensory processing that's very similar to how a computer takes um, information in. You take it in with your ears, you take it in with your eyes, or you do uh, tactile processing. So basically, you watch videos and then you copy the code, you learn how to do it, you watch people doing it, and by this way, you learn. Then you have the working memory, which is very similar to how we do this today, or like from the concept, it's very similar to uh, how we do today machine learning, because when you're getting um, information in your ears, there's a certain part which keeps there. When you're looking with your eyes, there's a certain part which keeps there. You don't always process 100%. You don't get 100%. When you're looking with your fingers, there's a certain part which keeps there, like the movements. And this whole information which, you, which, which keeps there um, is something you can measure and you can digitalize. You cannot know, you cannot digitalize the other factors around it, like the audio pictures, text, videos, but you can measure from the 
um, you cannot measure the sensory processing of the things, but you can measure how much somebody's getting in or realistically getting in, um, not from testing, but really from um, putting a BP on people or by tracing it. For eyes, you can go with this eye movement, but that's all kind of the second step to um, providing a good environment because from all of these things, um, similar to what we do in machine learning, we um, like kids, they put mental models in front of it. They put visual models in front of it. They put tactile models, like that's what you do when you code um, in front of it. And um, this is then what's inside and what a small kid, kid will get from these uh, policies. And uh, if we're like considering the long-term learning, this will be what somebody's getting from it and what somebody will remember. Yeah. And um, looking at the looking back at the program, which is probably interesting for you, were able to scale in between 2009 and 2013 from basically 10 to 200 kids, which I think is an achievement, has grown to a couple of hundred since that in this program, and is continuing to grow and. Uh, I personally feel that it is very interesting to look at the success factors for um, human computer interaction instructional programs um, and uh, to look at it because like the developed countries, they can learn a lot from such policies where people have already done it 10 years uh, before um, and also use the data that they have acknowledged. Stephanie, I thank you very much. You the, I didn't want to give you the very uh, the various informations and the raw data, but rather show you the pictures. No, but that's good. That's good. Stephanie, thank you very much. Then uh, we can move over to uh, to the questions, and um, let's see how it goes. I may gather some if uh, if it's if it's if it's quite a few of them. And uh, I think Karina, you wanted to go first, if I see that correctly. Hello, um, thank you very much. Um, I have one question directed at Veronika Wittmann. And um, you mentioned that um, digital diplomacy was a tool to prevent humanity's downfall. So my question is, um, what kind of tools do you think are um, important in digital diplomacy? And do you think it's desirable to use digi digital diplomacy in, a, in, in an interactive way, so to engage with the audience? Or is it better to use a top-down method and um, which would um, inform people in a one-sided manner? Thank you very much. Thank you, Karina. And then Veronica, I'm going to hand you over to you straight away. Thank you very much, Karina. It's an interesting question. Um, I think uh, regarding if it's more like a traditional form or more like an interactive way, um, I mean, of course, I think like digital tools somehow reshape um, the working field of diplomats because like for long term, I think diplomats were somehow, you know, uh, perceived to work uh, to a large extent behind closed doors. And of course, like some of the digital tools can be somehow really endangering if they are not used uh, in a competent and a professional way. This is why I think um, like all of the curricula for the diplomatic corps uh, has to provide um, like really professional training on how to use this tool in order, you know, to engage um, in a sustainable way to find like, you know, peaceful treaties and so on and so on. If I imagine uh, a difficult uh, political scenario and then somebody is using, um, I don't know, Twitter or, or any other kind of social media account, it can actually cause much more troubles than it 
was meant to be. So I think um, there has to be a training on, on all of it. I think um, it has to be also interactive because I think the working uh, areas of diplomats change to a large extent. And of course, like um, this scenario of, of a global turn in politics relates pretty much to the discussion uh, what is the role of nation states and how do you, diplomats perceive themselves and they always inter, um, active, uh, interactive uh, with different kind of like, um, you know, let's call them stakeholders, be it uh, civil society, be it other diplomats, be it um, enterprises, be it companies, whoever. Um, so I think um, there should be both scenarios but always with a focus on a competent and professional way. And as an agenda, I mean, maybe uh, to, to clarify this point, we talked a lot on science diplomacy as well and digital diplomacy. I think one of the main uh, focus point of both of science diplomacy uh, and digital diplomacy is that scientists as well as diplomats can really be perceived in this century as being global actors. So they always somehow transcend um, this kind like of closed borders or, or containers, or how to say. So they might be still, you know, um, affected in a nation state context or in a regional context, but at the end of the day, they transcend these borders. And they can be, like both groups, I think scientists and diplomats can be seen as an epistemic community. And this is actually the focal point. This is why I'm quite optimistic about scientists and diplomats in this sense, because they, they are trained experts um, on, on this arena. So I think uh, it has to be both ways, actually. Monica, thank you. Stephanie, uh, was there a hand up? for asking a question or? Um, I, I was teaching a lot of tech courses for interactive technology for using microcontrollers. And I had the impression that uh, the most effective thing is if people are doing it hands on and really use it and apply it in order to understand what's happening and develop this kind of computational thinking to understand how code works, how machines think because I think there's a really big difference if you train an AI mechanism and feed data and uh, give a certain amount of uh, a variety of data to that machine, <laughs> then if you work with people, with kids, there is creativity going on, there is um, interpretation and projection going on. So I think Mm, I, I didn't understand how, what you mean with learning technology in a, in a way that it cannot be misused because I think technology only de develops further and gets used <laughs> by uh, getting maybe used in the wrong way, you know, or used by someone who makes mistakes and someone who applies it. There's Martin Rauchbar also had his hand up for quite a while, and we talked quite a bit about diplomacy, so there's no wonder. <laughs> yeah, no, sure. I, I think, uh, again, I mean, it's, it's, uh, the, the question was really, uh, uh, if I understood it correctly, whether, whether the tools um, that we use in, in diplomacy, the digital tools, uh, and as well as the topics of digital diplomacy, as Veronica pointed out, the global challenges, whether, whether this should be um, interactive or not, and I think I think uh, clearly they have them, I and mean, there has to be an element of public diplomacy engaging with the public, and that requires, as Veronica pointed out, a, a digital literacy and and, and a, compass, a competency to use um, these tools. But I would like to also point to another aspect, which um, maybe uh, we encounter, uh, which is that sometimes these discussions about global challenges. Um, uh, happen in very siloed environments of, of um, you know, academics sometimes talk about uh, digital challenges, challenges of key technologies in an academic environment. Uh, and then uh, diplomats talk about it in a, in a multilateral uh, environment, in, in some multilateral organizations or forums at the UN. Uh, and, 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 and so what I think is sometimes important and that what we've felt uh, was successful is if we try to bring these people together 
um, you know, just simply to create a new language, to, to, to bring them together with artists, bring them together with civil society, with activists, and, and that we all break out of our silos and, and, and ways of talking about these issues, uh, which, which uh, uh, sometimes, you know, it, just bringing a, a bunch of people from very, very different backgrounds together and talk about social media and the challenges as we did uh, in, in our Taming Tech initiative. It was remarkable uh, to see uh, that we don't really share the same language, we don't really share the same terms, even though we are talking about the same kind of problem. And th that uh, is, is an actually a very, very interesting experience and, and points uh, to diplomacy uh, also as, um, you know, potential mediators, facilitators, bringing different siloed uh, worlds uh, together uh, in order to talk about the same issues and problems. And in a way, this uh, open Austria is very well set up for doing that, right? I mean, I find it quite fascinating so that you're represented by, uh, on the face of a two different profession, right? So the, the, the career the career diplomat on the one and and, and the and the artist. On the on the other, um, and may I may I abuse my 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 moderation uh, position here to ask questions my, myself quickly, and um, and I have a few, so I'm just gonna go through them and then and then and then I'm gonna hand over the word to you to 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 respond, and I'm just gonna go in the order in which you you present it. Um, so Martin, the first one would be uh, for you. There's been now in the questions and answers, also in Veronica's talk quite a bit about what digital means for, for diplomacy. Uh, in your opinion, in terms, of, uh, in terms of what digital changes, what actually changes about the diplomatic profession? What actually perhaps should change in terms of how we train diplomats? It's also quite an important question actually for, for us. Um, Clara, um, you're basically doing a triangulation there almost in terms of your role. So there's something about the arts, there's something about technology, and there's something about diplomacy. And I would just like to know how easy you find it to bring these, uh, to bring these three together. Um, to uh, Veronica, uh, in terms of uh, digital diplomacy, there is sometimes this, this argument by practitioners and by theorists actually of diplomacy that, uh, that digital diplomacy, yeah, in a way is a, is a, is a good aid for, for a few things, but there is also the problem that the personal touch is not there. And, uh, and so there's this, this kind of uh, meeting somewhere over coffee quickly or, or smoking a cigarette or something. So things that can actually change things quite a bit and say in multilateral negotiations, they're not there. I was wondering what do you what do you think about that? So basically, the mixture perhaps between um, digital diplomacy and and the, and the more traditional diplomacy as we are used to it. Um, Stephanie Wuschik on the Wuschik, so, sorry on the on the um, uh, on the Indonesia part. No, I thought it was really fascinating because you have this long durée study, and there is this there is the social movement and uh, and the networks and organizes itself differently uh, over time and, uh, and and to some extent then probably reinvents itself and my question was just whether you think that um, the judging by this by this in-depth case study whether this 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 digital reinvention channels doings practices in certain directions rather than others so whether it's actually the medium that really makes a, a difference there, or whether or whether it's just the, the the agents, in your case, the women themselves. And um, uh, the other Stephanie, Stephanie Ness, the the uh, a question for you that that, that that is just always on my mind. Actually, quite a few books in the background about that. So so um, education to some extent, especially particular subjects that happen still very much along uh, the lines of the nation state, right? So schools, uh, one of the covers of the books that I would find now would show it is, is uh, basically schools tell the pupils uh, about their nationality and what they're supposed to stand for and all of that. 
Um, then Veronica before was talking about peace and, and, and one of the, the great uh, theorists of peace, Johann Galtung, also somewhere there in the background, says this is exactly the problem that we have, yeah? so that the, the, the education is, is very much, the whole imagination is very much along the, the lines of the, the nation state. And it's basically an, an advocacy uh, to, to, uh, to move education along uh, to, uh, towards a more international outlook. And I was wondering what you think about that uh, and whether you think that digitalization would offer any opportunities for doing so. So there was a lot of questions, I'm sorry. I think I'm gonna, I'm gonna hand over to Martin straight away and then we're gonna go down the... All right, I will try, try to be brief. Uh, the question was really about um, the trade of diplomacy and diplomats and how uh, much change is required. And I think um, if, if you think of, of, of diplomats and, and what they're good at, they're at the same time specialists uh, in some areas like international law, or international relations um, or political sciences, but they're also generalists. They, they often have a, a bird's uh, a, a bird's view, uh, a bird's eye view uh, on on global challenges and global uh, topics. And so, even if you think of a topic like technology or digitalization, which do require um, a certain amount of literacy and knowledge, or at least understanding, uh, for example, how artificial intelligence works in a in a very rudimentary way. Uh, if you talk about its implications on international relations, I think what diplomats can add bring to the table is this very generalist view. Uh, and uh, in that sense, and maybe it's a pointing a little bit to what, what Veronica said um, about the potential of, of diplomats, uh, of being actors of global change, I think they're, they, they bring an added value with who they are and, and, and what, they, what they bring to the table, uh, even to uh, topics like um, new, new technologies. So, um, the reality is, when, when, when I look at my, my colleagues, a lot of them are scared off by technology um, uh, topics because they feel they're overly complicated and, and, and impossible to understand. So some colleagues shy away from these uh, topics and issues. Uh, but I think that's a mistake uh, because what is really needed is a generalist view, an overview of the big picture uh, and bring that to the table when we look uh, at the implications of technology. Thank you. Well, um, picking up the baton here, um, yes, as Martin has stressed, the question of diplomacy in the fourth industrial revolution is an ongoing debate, where to place it and which role diplomats have in this, in, in this field. Um, with uh, Veronica talking about digital diplomacy, us talking about tech diplomacy. And there's another very important factor, which is cultural diplomacy, which in my opinion has gotten more relevant um, um, over the last 15 years or so within this new context that we operate in. Um, as Martin has stressed, this is the moment for generalists. This is actually the moment, um, and I always like to use that term, the future is interdisciplinary. So I think one major interesting fact that um, um, surfaced over the last say 20 years is the fact that our very um, our society that is driven towards expertise um, is now finding itself in, in this silification where we actually operate in very um, fragmented ways that often simply don't overlap but we're seeing that the challenges that we're facing and not only with the tackles that we've now presented but let's let's just say the major um, global crisis which is clearly climate, climate change but also disinformation and other things that we simply can't um, fend of ourselves in our silos. And that goes out for scientists and academics to policymakers and or activists and artists. So this is the moment where we really need to join forces and um, advocate for this um, new form of interdisciplinary transnational collaboration. And um, you asked the question of how do those three silos, art, tech, and policy relate, and how does this, um, this abstract, um, um, uh, say, a collaboration actually work out in a tangible way? Um, we're still experimenting with this. And the first finding Martin has already stated, which is we often see that um, there's, there's not even a shared reality that we can draw on. So people, when they talk about simple terminology such as what constitutes technology, what constitutes truth, 
what constitutes um, digitalization. All those terms have, um, have simply very different meanings depending on which expert groups uses them and in which context. So the first step would clearly be to bring people in a room and try to find common understanding of the things that we talk about. So if a policymaker uses the term technology, they use it in a very, very different way than a technologist. And so if an artist um, starts engaging with the technologies, there's also a very different understanding because clearly a technology sees themselves as an artist. And so there's so many ways where at first, even to start um, working on a practical level, we need to create a shared reality. And from that, we can um, you know, try to tackle those problems. And this is the way Honestly, that's our pitch, but this is where we really see a necessity for diplomacy coming into fruition and really taking up a space where there's currently a vacuum. Well, thank you very much for the interesting question on the personal touches mission, of course. Um, but I would see it as a very positive side. Um, like I think we've seen like, um, if I think of the last General Assembly at United Nations, there were a lot of diplomats, uh, you know, arguing, oh, now I cannot talk uh, like I'm used to talk at coffee breaks or arrange something uh, in a way how I used to do. But I would be still very, very positive. Um, like um, I said before, I cannot imagine any other professional group really being more trained um, on, you know, entering like new arenas. I mean, diplomats, they always like sitting on a fence, no? They, they always look to the neighbor's garden, come back to their own garden. So I think um, for me, as a, as a professional group, they are really, really uh, the most experts in trying to find this global cooperation and trying to figure out what I would say is so largely missing up to now, this governance structure in the digital world. So I'm very, very positive. And the other thing is only it needs um, a well education. This is what uh, diplomatic academies are actually uh, should do all over the world. Uh, uh, diplomats should be trained on using uh, like all these positive experts of, of these technological innovations in a professional way. This is why I was saying, no, 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 not, you know, in order to attack somebody or in order to, to figure out difficult scenarios, but for transparency reasons, for instance, for interaction with citizens, uh, for an exchange in times of a global crisis, uh, to cooperate and, and to learn together and to find mutual agreement. And I personally cannot imagine any other uh, group so much being trained on this. And I think uh, like we need diplomats who are well-trained and competent with these tools in order to, to reach um, this kind of like, you know, peace, sustainable transformation. And I think really the challenges um, for humanities are really enormous and we will only manage it if we have this specifically trained expert like diplomats are. But of course it needs a lot of, of training and of course a shifting from a traditional working sphere to, I would not only say it's either or, use both of the tools. One day we will be able, uh, we will um, uh, succeed over, over Corona pandemic and people can meet in cafeterias again and chat and still use these traditional tools, but also take the positive side of this technological innovation. And I personally cannot imagine a better group of, of professionals than diplomats actually to find this kind of mutual agreements across the globe. Hello, thank you. Um... I think the question you posed to me was if that movement um, was changing the media people are using or the practices. Did I get you right? Now I was just basically interested in the, the impact of the digital. So, 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 uh, so, there's, so there is a movement that uh, obviously way before the digital age, and then and then there is something else developing, and whether the just the medium of the digital. So, so whether that has changed something yeah. or whether yeah. Yeah, I think what was established back then was um, uh, organizing without organization, a non-hierarchical democratic form of learning among small groups and peers. 
And that was back then introduced to uh, have literacy on the countryside, but now it's introduced to have tech literacy. So what you'll find in Indonesia is that digitalization is really going strong. You have um, a lot of different services available now from Gojek to um, what have you. And uh, the self-organized infrastructure is facilitated through uh, digital tools. So open source is very important because people in Indonesia want to have personal adaptions to the personal challenges. Um, so the software has to adapt to their very specific um, context. Um, and I think on the larger scale, if you look for uh, the bigger picture, it's uh, what I find there in the digitalization and in this, all these initiatives in tech and also AI is the, a lot um, of conversations on ethics ethics of knowledge transfer, ethics of knowledge circulation, ethics of exchanging skills. So that's why people have a massive online presence. Groups uh, are really visible through digital platforms, but you will not find them on site. There's no physical representation. There, you will not be able to see any room or <laughs> house. The, it's, it's all online because there was so much trauma about being persecuted for sharing your ideas and sharing knowledge. Mm. Did I answer your question? Or was it you did, you did. <laughs> Thanks, Stefan. Um, your question, basically pointing at the books, I would like to dissect it into two parts. The first one being is how far the nation states can control their primary education systems in a world of the global markets that we're currently having and the supranational political organizations. And along with that, from what I'm understanding as a question is how distinctive will the national educational systems um, remain against pressures for international convergence? And uh, in order to answer this, as you have seen from my example and from current things, I feel that um, currently we're in a time where um, the state is not instantly losing influence over the education of kids, but as they're at home, there's of course less control. And then there's of course also different quality because of the context in which the education takes place. So in the long run, of course, the, there's a loss of control of the state. And of course, um, parents will look out for, as a simple example, for the easy solutions to teach their kids, looking at uh, basically systems that where everything's prepared. So this will of course lead to more similar systems across the world. And uh, even though the socioeconomic problems, they may look um, very different on the surface. In reality, they're not, because in the context of uh, human-computer interaction, you're always having one person interacting with a screen. Um, so the, pro the problems that you have in the long run, they stay more, they get, they're getting more similar across the world. And this will, of course, also influence um, the way that uh, education takes place, in my opinion. And the second point of your question is uh, probably the question, how far states can promote their national cultures through education and what form these should take in the pluralistic societies. So now when we're looking at the education of kids of today in Germany, that's where I grew up, um, and you look at what you give kids in the ages, especially women in the ages of six, seven, eight, nine, or 10 to play, then you're giving them dolls and you're giving them tools uh, with which they were originally planning to prepare these kids for a role of mother. And when you're looking at um, the digital technology, what it can do it can connect kids with different role models, can show them different, can show them basically the world. So in that regards, 
I feel or that uh, the digital technology is also a way of giving kids an opportunity, giving them a different outlook from the growth in society that can relate in very small things. But when you're looking at other societies, such as um, such as um, Eastern or Asian societies, it's also interesting because there, uh, or like when it's more repressive, their like connection via computers is really the only way for kids to see a different future. And um, in that regards, there's also the uh, last question that I was trying to mostly answer with my um, presentation. And this uh, question is uh, whether European states see opportunities uh, in the digitalization, not only in terms of procurement, like procuring new computer system, like they used to procure the books 50 years ago, but also in terms of shaping society's values. And for this, and we, it probably didn't elaborate so much, we can already see examples in Austria when we're giving kids, when we are giving kids um, the opportunity to um, to uh, learn coding skills using small uh, robots, like Lego robots, and you're giving this to women, we're finding out that as a result of giving this to the kids, more of these kids, they later want to be programmers, they want to be, uh, they, they have confidence in themselves to choose technical professions. Not all will choose, others will have others' interests, but they at least have the confidence in order to do so. And in so far, I think that um, the digitalization um, doesn't only have like the educational potential, but can also shape, um, shape, um, yeah, shape uh, society development in also feminist strategies such as Stephanie pointed out across the world. Thank you, Stephanie. <laughs> we have, we would have a little more time for discussion. I'm just going to read uh, a comment or summarizing a comment uh, by Mark Robinson again. Mark, thanks a lot for participating very actively here. And I'm just going to summarize quickly. So he points out, uh, agreeing with, Veron with Veronica, um, that uh, there's quite a history of scientists networking across state boundaries as epistemic communities. Um, he especially alludes to big science, uh, examples such as CERN or ITER, and, uh, and also uh, the current management or co-management of, uh, of the COVID-19 situation yeah um, and there's there's definitely something to that i think so too so that that uh, obviously our science networks and with the world becoming more and more complex uh this this, this boundary between politics and and, and science that's going to be more and more important and probably the blurrier it is the the better so then um under normal circumstances this would happen now in the fest uh, which is uh, about 50 meters away or so from here there would be a big round of applause so thank you very 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 much for for your participation perhaps special thanks actually to our californians because it was i think they had to get up quite quite early in the morning and I did see uh, a coffee cup or, or, or another uh, being, being, being drunk. I mean, I totally understand that. Thank you very, very much for participating. And uh, thank you very much also to the audience for listening in and, uh, and for asking questions and making comments. And um, the proceedings of this for people who are, who are interested from, from, from the audience. So we're going to write up a, a little something. It's going to be published in our diplomacy series. And, uh, and obviously it will also be uh, available online on our YouTube channel. Good, so then I wish our Californians uh, a very nice day and, uh, and the rest, probably most of the rest, a very nice evening. Thanks a lot for participation, for your participation, bye-bye. <laughs>